Good evening, everyone. How nice it is to see people in uh, person again after so long. So let's get started. Uh, Netherlandish painting of the 17th century is very different from the Roman Catholic Mediterranean Baroque works we are possibly more used to. Musa's collection of Baroque works of the Mediterranean countries, namely Malta, Italy, France and Spain, has been studied and uh, published ex extensively. For example, here you can see the works by Valentin de Bologna, Giuseppe de Ribera and Guido Reni, which we are all very familiar with. Netherlandish painting is also very different from Flemish painting, although there are overlaps. Flanders, or today's Belgium, or as it was known back then, the Southern Netherlands, which you can see in pink at the bottom, was under the control of Catholic Spain while the uh, United Netherlands or the Republic of Netherlands, Netherlandish provinces were uh, independent. And uh, since the Southern Netherlands for Flanders were under control of Catholic Spain, the same artistic language of the High Baroque, was, as was propagated by the Roman Catholic Counter-Reformation, was adopted. In fact, the art of Peter Paul Rubens, which you can see here on the left, the greatest exponent of the Flemish Baroque, possibly, with its theatricality, sensuality and dynamism, is perhaps closer to the works of the Roman Baroque, such as, for example, Caravaggio or the Caraccis that we, are, we see over here. And uh, his uh, compatriots, Ant Anthony van Dyck and Jacob Jor Jordans, also show similar influences. In the Musa collection, Flemish Baroque is uh, best represented by the flamboyant painting here on the left, of the Allegory of the City of Antwerp by Theodor van Tulden. Most of the Flemish works at Musa have also been recently exhibited and discussed in a paper by Dr. Sandro de Bono, including the works by Matthias Tom, one of which is on the right, the Circle of Anthony van Dyck and David de Heijn. Unfortunately, the Dutch 17th century paintings in the collection have received less attention and still await study. Um, possibly because uh, there aren't many experts on uh, this subject or people have decided to tackle this subject so, so far and I am no expert either, so <laughs> um, uh, please uh, bear, in mind, bear this in mind. But we are presenting new, new research that we have been working on in the curatorial team in the last year or so. Uh, recently, in 2011, there was an undergraduate dissertation on Dutch and Flemish uh, painting by Robert Kondai which has given a good overview of uh, what is present in Maltese public collections, although it is not exhaustive. Um, some of these little known paintings are what we will be studying today. But before talking about these, we have to understand the political, social and religious environment of the period. Dutch art was largely Protestant. Um, over here, you can see, yes, you can see. Uh, the Calvinist Northern uh, Netherlands in uh, blue, so they were Protestant. And over here you have the, f the Spanish Netherlands, which were uh, Catholic. The form and content of Protestant painting reflected the simpler, more factual and more personal Christianity of the Reformation movement. Certain features of Baroque art, such as naturalism and chiaroscuro, also feature in Dutch painting while other tendencies such as theatricality and dynamism were not as popular, although we cannot generalize. The church stopped issuing commissions for figurative art, leaving artists and private patrons to determine content of religious imagery. However, artists like Rembrandt still received commissions for religious works from private collectors, but the overall production of religious works subsided. Narrative scenes from the Bible, for example, here on the right you can see the return of the prodigal son by Rembrandt, uh, especially in, also in book illustration and in printing. And here you can see one of uh, Rembrandt's most famous prints, the uh, Christ preaching, also known as the 100 Gilder print, because it uh, cost that much. It was one of the most expensive prints to buy in, during the period. And uh, basically, paintings, religious paintings which had a moral message were still popular among private collectors. However, since religious art diminished, especially from the church, painters decided to uh, vary their output and they moved towards uh, secular forms of art, uh, which glorify God by portraying natural beauty and his creations, such as uh, 
still lifes, for example. Here you see the female painter Rachel Ruysch and uh, landscape. And you see a painting by Jacob van Ruysdale. And also depicting people who are created in his image. Here's a portrait by, by Franz Hals. And uh, obviously, Jean paintings, uh, the epitome of Jean painting, I, in my opinion, is reached in the works of Johannes Vermeer. The term which maybe we are used to hearing, golden, uh, the golden age of painting the, of the Dutch, of the, Dutch uh, of the Netherlands, refers not, not just to the artistic output of the Netherlands, it also refer, refers to a period of prosperity, peace and opulence. During this period, the Netherlands became the most powerful maritime and economic force in Europe. And the term, however, the term Golden Age has recently received criticism as it does not do justice to those who were exploited during this period of colonial expansion and slavery. The successes of the period and of this Golden Age in the Netherlands were reflected in the developments of the arts due to an increasing, increasingly wealthy and large middle class especially because of all this prosperity, mostly merchants, the demand for paintings to adorn new luxurious houses and to commemorate patrons grew steadily and influenced the popularity of certain subjects over others. Dutch art spread throughout Europe on the commercial fleets and it is not surprising that it made its way to Malta in the hands of the nobility and also members of the Order of the Knights of St. John. The National Collection contains an interesting array of Dutch paintings of the 17th century, which reflect these peculiarities of Netherlandish painting. Jean's scenes are represented by the works of Nicolas van Heiften and Dirk Helmbrecker. I also apologize for the, my pronunciation of Dutch names. Okay. So these two works by van Heiften are oil and copper paintings. They are very small. They are dated 1704. You can see a woman playing the flute on the left and a woman singing on the right. These are typical simple genre scenes and uh, the, these type of paintings were highly soft, sought after and were popular for very long. In fact, these are 1704, quite late. And another example of similar paintings are these by Jan Mies Mollaner, which are earlier. And uh, well, van, who was Van Haften? He was actually a minor painter who remains known for portraits and genre scenes. You see another example of his work here on the left. And he also did engravings of genre scenes. While his engravings are relatively common, paintings, excuse me, paintings by him in museum collections are actually fewer. The RKD, which is the Netherlands Institute of Art History, which has extensive online databases of works by Northern painters, lists only three paintings securely attributed to Van Haften, which are in museums. There may be others because the database is not exhaustive, but it is quite a good database. And the two Maltese works we mentioned were uh, bought by the Valletta Museum in 1933, so quite some of the earliest works bought by the museum, and they were from the collection of Reverend Giuseppe Vassallo of Emdina. Moving on to two other Dutch Jean uh, scenes, we have these works by Dirk Hanbrecker. He came from an entirely different school of painting. He formed part of uh, a group known as the Bambocchanti. They were Dutch and Flemish painters living and working in Rome, who specialized in Jean scenes. They were active from around 1625 till the end of the century. They brought the existing Netherlandish tradition of painting scenes from everyday life to Italy. Despite having subjects deemed of the lowest ranks, such as uh, these two scenes here of peasants uh, and gamblers outside the town or outside the country inn, for example, the works of the Bambachanti were very popular about, among collectors and they fetched good prices. Uh, these works were, brought, were bought by the museum in 1991 from the Militancy Art Gallery, which some of you might remember. I don't remember it, I was too young. Um, another very popular form of secular art was uh, still life. Still life developed as a genre on its own in the Netherlands in the 16th and 17th centuries, reaching high levels of quality. The word still life actually derives from the Dutch term still living. 
Still life paintings often contain religious and allegorical symbolism relating to the objects depicted. Paintings showing arrangements of flowers, food, game and various objects in the form of vanitas paintings could be used to deliver a moral message or simply to glorify God through the beauty of everyday objects. This painting from the Musa collection shows uh, it has at times been attributed to uh, the famous still life painter Willem Kleis Haida, um, but it's not a secure attribution, obviously. And it is an intriguing painting. We have what is known as a romer on the left, which is that, that uh, type of glass, drinking glass. It has fruit, a clay pipe, and a porcelain delft plate with walnuts. This is the, on the left is the work of William Kleis Heida, um, and on the right we see work, another work by Simon Lutikus, which is perhaps more similar to our painting because it contains a curtain, which is very rare in uh, these kind of still life paintings. Our painting remains a good example of the Dutch tradition of still life. Unfortunately, we will not be able to see this because it is in the reserve collection, but we'll be seeing other interesting works from the Dutch and Flemish collection. We have said that the popularity of religious imagery within churches declined in the Netherlands in the 17th century. However, religious paintings were still commissioned and bought by private collectors, taking the form of history paintings with a moral lesson. In the Musa collection is this interesting painting in, the genre, in this genre depicting Belshazzar's feast. The story of Belshazzar and the writing on the wall is found in the Old Testament book of Daniel. The Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar looted the temple in Jerusalem and stole the sacred artifacts such as golden cups. The golden cups that you see here, for example, on the large table in the middle and on the small table on the lower right. His son, Belshazzar, used these cups for a great feast where the hand of God appeared and wrote the inscription on the wall prophesizing the downfall of Belshazzar's reign. Now the inscription on the wall is up here and there's the ha a hand of God, but uh, with uh, time the varnish has darkened so much that it is ver barely visible. So in this painting, Belshazzar, on, who is seated over here on the left, has just seen the writing on the wall and he is sh showing uh, shock. While his guests are still enjoying the feast, the table is set with lavish riches and the guests at the feast are dressed in their finest attire. Lit only by slender candles on the table and the chandelier, the faces of the guests on the left side of the table near Belshazzar are illuminated by this warm hue, while a torch to the right sheds light on the face of a servant down here on the right who, like Belshazzar, has just seen the hand of God writing on the wall. The rest of the painting is shrouded in darkness. Now, this painting interests me a lot because it is actually inspired by an engraving, which you can see here on the left. It's an engraving by Jan Harmens Müller. And it, this was very widely known and very much copied. Müller adopted Northern mannerism. In fact, he is from the, uh, this, this engraving is from the late 16th century. And uh, especially, his figures are especially uh, sensuous. And uh, in many of, many of his engravings and drawings survive. However, he was also a painter, but only one painting by him survives. Müller's original drawing for this composition actually survives at the Rijksmuseum, which you can see on uh, the right. It is oriented in the reverse because when drawings are transferred to copper plates, the resulting print is a mirror image. This shows that the present painting at Musa is based on the engraving, not on the drawing. So it's definitely not by Müller. Um, the painting was so popular that there are many copies of it, which you can find online. For example, there is, I just put, put three over here, one by Franz Reicher another by Ambrosius Franken and an anonymous Netherlands artist um, uh, painting at the Consistorisch Museum in Vienna. The theme of Belshazzar's feast remained popular because of its moral message and perhaps the most imp important and uh, well-remembered example of this, of this theme is uh, Belshazzar's feast by Rembrandt, which is a very different kind of 
painting than our more mannerist one. Um, here you can see some the theatricality and still the sensuality of the Baroque. And the writing on the wall is much more evident. And, uh, well, our painting was possibly in the Grand Master's Palace collection. And it was, however, it was placed in the Receiver General's office in 1888. When Rembrandt moved to Leiden, from Leiden to Amsterdam in 1631, he gathered a large studio of pupils and many other artists not under his wing were still influenced by his paintings. So his, uh, his style became adopted by not just his pupils, but by many other artists as well. In the same style as Rembrandt's works and also from the Grand Master's Palace um, is this painting showing a hermit reading, which has traditionally been identified as Saint Jerome. Although the usual attributes such as the cardinal's hat and the lion are not present. The work has always been exhibited as anonymous, described as Netherlandish school of the 17th century. It is clearly in the style of Rembrandt and his followers. For example, you here you can see two other hermits by uh, one is after Rembrandt and the other is by Gerrit Dow, who was a, a direct uh, pupil of Rembrandt. Notice the similar warm palette and the chiaroscuro. And uh, well, our painting shows a skull on the right, which is a memento mori, or a reminder that death comes to all, giving this painting a moral subject, which is why it was popular as a subject in, uh, in Dutch painting. Interestingly, this painting is dated 1646, and it bears a curious monogram showing a globe with a cross and the initials HVA. Now, uh, these uh, haven't, weren't, uh, I weren't deciphered until a few months ago. And the way we identified the name of the artist is actually unconventional because we posted this on Twitter. And a Dutch art historian identified the monogram and told us that's the monogram of uh, Herman van Aldeverld. And uh, who is this painter? Um, basically, well, we also discussed the attribution with the RKD, the Nether Netherlands Institute for Art History, which has since uploaded the painting to their page on the artist. So this is their, uh, their web page on Aldeverd, and our painting is on the second row on the left. Aldeverd, in fact, did sign his paintings with this monogram or with a signature. And he almost always includes a globe because part of his name, world, means world. And therefore, he replaces that part of his signature with a globe. And this is mostly found in uh, his engravings. For example, on the left, this is a portrait which was designed by Aldeverd and uh, engraved by others. But his signature, H, V, Alde, and the globe um, representing world, invent. So it, it, was, it was commonly used by him to sign his paintings and his engravings. From what we can gather, the Musa work is the earliest known painting by Aldeverd. Other works, such as the music lesson and the allegory of the five senses, date to the 1650s, while ours was 1646. And other paintings on the RKD website are from the 1660s, so even later. And again, it is noticeable from the RKD database that apart from the painting in Musa, there are only three other paintings which are in a museum by Aldeverd. Others were sold at auction or were about unknown. Comparing our painting to these two over here, one observes how in these later works, the painter's brush strokes become more opaque, the figures are more solid or heavier. And uh, the paint, in fact, the painting, our painting, was previously attributed in 2008 to the German painter Christopher Paudis by Albert Blankert, a Dutch art historian. Paudis was a German painter, a pupil of Rembrandt, who is known for using a sfumato technique, which, as you can see here on the right, there is a quite a sfumato technique used in the depiction of the flesh, for example. And that is similar to the technique that Aldeverd uses in this early work at Musa. 
If it wasn't for Aldeverell's signature, we wouldn't have been to able to reattribute this painting. However, Aldeverell remains not well studied and few works by him are known. So uh, we there is still more scope for research to place this work properly in his, in his oeuvre. Having, uh, moving on to the last painting we're discussing today, having spoken of a Rembrandtesque work, we cannot fail to mention another painting in the museum collection, which is also from the Grand Master's Palace and which has been overlooked for many years. We believe that this is from uh, Rembrandt Circle or Rembrandt Workshop. And uh, this has also been pointed out by uh, a friend of the museum, Dr. Nicolas uh, de Gaetano, who is here with us today, who pointed this out to us as well a few months back. Um, this is a small painting of a bearded old man. It is a character study, and in Dutch it is known as a troni. This, uh, for us, is an exciting work because it fits right into the corpus of works made by Rembrandt and his workshop around the 1630s. For example, over here you can see a painting attributed to Rembrandt, which is a bust of an old man, a follower of Rembrandt, another bearded man, and another one. And you can, such tronies also feature very much in Rembrandt's prints and uh, drawings. In order for us to gain more information the Diagnostic Science Laboratory of Heritage Malta has embarked on scientific analysis of the painting. This includes imaging methods such as infrared reflectography, which can reveal under paintings and pentimenti and ultraviolet fluorescence photography. Older varnishes and pigments tend to fluoresce, while newer materials do not. This could give an indication of later retouches and later varnishing. We are also going to do dendrochronology studies to date the wood of the panel, which hopefully will lead us to a proper date and therefore um, more um, closer attributions, uh, or at least closer to the workshop of Rembrandt, we hope. The uh, current attribution has also been discussed with international uh, Dutch art historians, such as uh, Martin Rosen Kitsch, who lives partly in Malta, and uh, we are working with them especially to study the scientific diagnostic uh, photography that we are gathering. Tonight, we have shared with you what is proving to be an exciting new area of research with Musa. Um, how did all of this start? Well, basically, during COVID, when the museum was closed, we bought, brought from Bigi, from Calcara, the head office of Heritage Malta, what was left of our reserve collection here. And we could see these paintings with new, fresh new eyes. And uh, this shows that there is still more work to be done, such as, for example, there are earlier 16th century Dutch works, which we still need to study. And I hope that this short presentation has shown that there is always more to discover within a museum, no matter how many times you have been there. And that paintings continue to reveal their secrets many years later through research and collaboration with international researchers. Now I invite you to ask questions and uh, afterwards we'll go see some of these Dutch and Flemish works in situ in the museum. Thank you.